I'd like to welcome you all back to the Exploring UCAT series. And I would like to begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Families, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this session of exploring the UCAT, the Youth Catechism, we are going through the Ten Commandments, and today we'll be discussing the two, uh, two commandments, the Fourth Commandment and the Fifth Commandment. We know that the Fourth Commandment tells us to honor our father and our mother. And beginning with question 367, which is where this commandment begins on page 202, question 367 asks, to whom does the fourth commandment refer and what does it require of us? The fourth commandment refers in the first place to one's physical parents, but also to people to whom we owe our life, our well-being, our security, and our faith. And so certainly we are grateful to God for what he has done for us, giving us parents who have given us life and who have given us all the many opportunities that, that we have in our lives. And we want to show them that respect, that reverence, and that honor. 368 asks, what place does family have in God's plan of creation? A man and a woman who are married to each other form together with their children a family. God wills that the love of the spouses, if possible, should produce children. These children who are entrusted to the protection and care of their parents have the same dignity as their parents. There is within the human family a, a certain imprint of the Trinity. When you think about who the Trinity is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that, that, that mystery of the Trinity, uh, one God and three persons, and there is this love of the Father for the Son and the love that the Son returns for the Father, and that love that is so intense between the two of them that it is another person, the Holy Spirit. Well, within human families, there is a, a, a slim, or a, a, not slim, but a very, um, God leaves his imprint in the human family, the Trinity leaves its imprint in the human family. When you think about the, the love that a husband has for a wife, and the love that she returns for her husband, and it is so intense that in some cases uh, that it is another person, a child. And there is this, this uh, Trinitarian imprint on families. But there is to be exactly love within a family. That selflessness, that caring, and that sharing that goes on. And it is within the context of family life that people learn what it is to love, to give of themselves, uh, to be self-sacrificing. Question 369 asks, why are families irreplaceable? Every child is descended from one father and one mother and longs for the warmth and safety of a family so that they may grow up secure and happy. We know that the family is the basic cell of human society and the values and principles and everything that we learn as human beings and, and really it is within the context of a family that we, we learn to be human, uh, to, to uh, lo again, love one another but it is where we grow up that has such a profound effect on who we will be uh, later on in our lives. The lessons you learn, both the, the good lessons, the, the ones that are fun to learn, and also the, the, the tough lessons uh, that uh, really form us, uh, what our parents teach us, is going to help us to be good Christians in the future, productive members of society. Uh, I, I think of so many things in my own family life growing up what I learned, you know, to, things to be self-sacrificing, but especially because I grew up in a family of seven kids, I, one of the things I learned, the world didn't revolve around me. You know, with siblings, you realize you have to share, you know. Um, one of the things we learned early on, uh, my mother would never let us have a whole piece of gum when she pulled it out of the Wrigley Spearmint uh, pack. She would always tear it in half, and we always had to have half a piece of gum. And now that I am an adult and I go home with my adult siblings and the joke is, you know, 
you want a piece of gum? And we always tear a half off and, and give it to brother or sister and we have a good laugh about it. But, you know, the lesson was the world doesn't revolve around you, you know. Of course, uh, you, you can eat a whole piece of gum. That, that's not the point. But my mom was trying to teach us that, uh, and it, it took a while for it to sink in, but that, that selflessness, you know, you can, you can uh, give of yourself a little bit. You can share. There is a quote in the margins on page 204 that's, that's very good from an ancient Chinese philosopher. He says, in the family, if the family is in order, the state will be in order. If the state is in order, the great community of mankind will live in peace. And when you think about the family as the basic cell of human society, how important it is that there be a loving father, a loving mother, and if it's God will, God's will for them to have children, that there be order there. Because if there is disorder there, then that disorder is going to flow out of the home and it's going to affect all of society. That addresses what question number 370 has to say. Why should the state protect and promote families? And the answer is the welfare and future of a state depends on the ability of the smallest unit within it, the family, to live and develop. And so that's why the family should be a, a sacred, uh, sacrosanct community that the, that the state does not intrude into uh, unless there be some extreme circumstances why there would be a reason for the, for the state and authorities to come in. But the, the state does not need to dictate to the family how children should be raised. The fine print on 270 says it well. No state has the right to intrude on the basic cell of society, the family, by its regulations or to question its right to exist. No state has the right to define family differently for the family's commission comes from the Creator. No state has the right to deprive the family of its fundamental functions, especially in the area of education. On the contrary, every state has the duty to support families with its assistance and to ensure that its material needs are met. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that the state is going to, you know, hand things out for the family. That it doesn't mean that the family won't have to work for its own support. But the state can't define what a family is, who a family is. And when you think about where we are in society today and some of the, the uh, individual states in the United States, for example, that are promoting same-sex marriage and they're trying to redefine what a family is. You know, they're saying it could be two men or it could be two women. Well, that's contrary to what we have learned from the scriptures. It's contrary to the way that God created male and female. There is a, a love between male and female that is fruitful, that brings forth new life. Whereas those other arrangements that are not, that are not family at all, uh, they may be, uh, you know, people who, who think they are in love. It's a very twisted type of love. Uh, they're confused in some way, but nonetheless, it's not for the state to define what a family is when you think about the way that God has created uh, husband and wife to share that love with one another, to bring forth children into the world. Question 371 asks, how does a child respect his parents? And we know that we are to show our parents love and respect at, at all times. Uh, we may disagree with some things that they have said or have done in the past, but you, we need to be grateful for the life that they have given us. And even if we had a hard childhood growing up, nonetheless, I think it, it still, we, we still need to have that gratitude and that respect. We don't know what all our parents may have gone through in their own lives. And so just to be grateful to God for what they have given, what our parents have given to us. Uh, and the, the older we get to try to grow in devotion and love of our parents. Question 372 asks, how do parents respect their children? God, we know, entrusted children to parents so that they might be steady, righteous examples for those children, that they might love and respect them and do everything possible so that their children can develop physically and spiritually. You know, children are not the property of their parents. I mean, each unique individual human being is, is a child of God, and if you want to assign ownership, we belong to God, not to our parents. And, and so to have children is not a right. Uh, children are a gift from God, and it's really important that, that parents understand that, and therefore parents do not dictate to their children how they think that uh, they should, uh, how their children should live out their lives, you know, dictating to their children, well, you know, you're a really good mathematician, so you should be a math teacher or an engineer or some sort of a scientist. 
because maybe God has another plan for that, per that young person. Maybe he wants them uh, to, to go another route, to be a priest or a religious. It is imperative that parents give a good example to their kids and to give them the opportunities to answer God's call. It's sad in society today when parents, you know, they, they limit maybe the way, that the number of children that they're going to have. They say, well, we can only afford to have one child. Um, that needs to be something that they pray about and that they talk to one another about, and, but to be open to the, the gifts that God will send them in life. Because the fewer number of children that they have, you know, they're going to want to be more involved in their lives. And there's this tendency in, in society today for parents to live even vicariously through the lives of their children, through, you know, sports or other extracurricular activities. And those activities are good and can, can really, you know, offer, offer an opportunity for the kids to build character. But if the, uh, the, the parents are living vicariously through their children, it's, and, and um, they only have one child, you know, and they're dictating to their child how they're going to live. That's, that's not uh, respectful of the child's uh, relationship with God because God has a, a special way he's going to, to call that young person. And parents need to be open to that and to try to foster that as best they can. They need to teach their children the faith and to teach them their prayers, to have sacramentals around their homes, uh, to make it to Mass on a regular basis. Now, that I, I uh, grew up in a, in a Catholic family, for, you know, all my life, and it was uh, the case that as my parents and my fa uh, the, the family grew and we got older, you know, the practice of the faith became more and more important. As the, the children were drawn into the classes for sacramental prep, I know I saw my parents take their faith more and more seriously. It's not that they were ever outside the faith, but it was neat to, for the, the family to kind of grow together because mom and dad understood, you know, the importance of passing the faith on. And they ended up passing it on to us kids by example. Uh, so that's why I cannot emphasize enough. And, and these questions in the uh, UCAT 373, uh, 374 really are encouraging families to grow together in prayer. The... Um, the, the case, it's not the case that a, uh, parents have to turn their homes into a monastery, you know, and all the kids have to be, uh, like when they line up at church, I, I know I heard a priest talking one time, he saw a family walk in and there were, there were seven kids lined up in the pew, and they were like Mr. and Mrs. Perfect and their, their seven little perfectites, you know, because they were just, you know, their backs were ramrod straight, and look, this is not a natural position for a three-year-old in church. I mean, it's the charism of a three-year-old to wiggle. I mean, they do that, you know. Um, it, but but it's, it's dad's jo job or mom's job to, to try to, you know, get him to hold still and then yeah, get him to pay attention. Uh, parents feel like that everybody has to be perfect all the time and, uh, you know, kids don't do that. It's the, that. That's where mom and dad are made saints, through their patience and through their prayerful, prayerfulness and, and through their, their guiding the little ones in church. But, but again, teaching them how to pray and giving them that Catholic culture within the home to understand that there is a personal relationship that we must have with God. Question 374 asks, why is God more important than the family? Without a relationship, a person cannot live. Man's most important relationship is the one he has with God. And this has priority all over, over all human relationships, even family relationships. And so again, the parents must foster that faith and they must offer an opportunity for faith formation. The faith needs to not just be something that kind of gets plugged in between soccer practice and, and uh, football practice. It needs to have a prominent place if it's Wednesday nights or Sundays after Mass that, okay, we're Catholic. I want my child to learn the Catholic faith. We're going to make sure that this happens, that they have the time to uh, learn their faith in their catechism class and they, they, they make it to the activities that are going to, to be faith building in their lives. Question 375 asks, how is authority exercised correctly? And we know that within a family there, there is a, a hierarchical structure with mother and father and they have to discipline their children at times. You can't be best friends with your kids. It's the case that parents are, are uh, teachers and mentors 
And while it's good to, to have fun, there are those times when a child needs discipline, they need structure, and they want that from their parents so that they know what the difference between right and wrong. And they can learn, again, how to be a good member of society, ultimately, is what they're going to, what you're, you're forming, good Christians and good members of society for the future. But if they're allowed to, to run rampantly without any direction at all, that, that's, that's, a, that's a parent's role, is to give a child direction and encouragement as to how to grow as a good human being, a good man or woman. Question 376 asks, what duties do citizens have towards the state? And every citizen has the duty to cooperate loyally with the civil authorities and to contribute to the common good in truth, justice, freedom, and solidarity. 377 asks, when must we refuse to obey the state? And the answer we know is no man may follow orders from the state that violates God's law. Uh, and so, for example, and we'll talk about this in the next commandment, the, uh, for example, laws regarding abortion, um, laws regarding same-sex marriage. Those are, those are laws that if they are passed, and we know that we have the abortion law, for example, those are laws we cannot condone and we want to uh, work for and fight for the reversal of those laws. Now the second, the next commandment we're going to go over is the fifth commandment, and we know that is you shall not kill. This begins on uh, page 208 and it's question 378. The UCAT asks, why is it not permissible to take one's own life or the lives of others? And we know that God alone is the author of life and he calls us home at, to our death. Except in the case of legitimate self-defense of oneself or another, no one may kill another human being. And so, with regards to this commandment, you, you never intentionally take the life of another human being. It does mention self-defense. Uh, in those cases, sometimes there, there, there will be those times when a person has to defend themselves against the force of an aggressor. Of course, even in that case of self-defense, you don't want to you know, go over the top and uh, you want to defend yourself. If, if the other person dies in the, in the process, that's, that's not on your soul. But still, we never do anything whereby we intentionally take the life of another human being. Question 379 asks, what sorts of attacks on human life are forbidden by the fifth commandment? Murder and acting as an accomplice to murder are forbidden. Killing unarmed civilians during a war is forbidden. The abortion of a human being from the moment of conception is forbidden. Suicide, self-mutilation, and self-destructive behavior are forbidden. Euthanasia, killing the handicapped, the sick, and the dying is also forbidden. And so with respect to these specific actions where we would take human life, we need to be very conscious that many of these things do go on today. And these are things that we ourselves want to avoid. We, are, we want to pray uh, that these things uh, come to an end, you know, those, those uh, civilians who are killed in time of war. And of course, we want to pray for peace at all times. But we don't condone any of them in any way. We're going to talk a little more as we go along, uh, more specifically, about these different ways of taking human life. But first, I would like to read a quote from a Jewish American physician uh, who had studied the Nazis in the, during the uh, 1930s and the crimes that they committed, that the Nazis committed against humanity. It's kind of a long quote, but it lays out well for us uh, something that we need to be aware of with respect to kind of having a, a desensitized attitude towards human life. Because it is the case that over time, if we, if we don't see a problem with small things, uh, we lose the big, uh, the big picture and we, we uh, don't have a problem with bigger things. Let me read the quote. The beginnings at first were merely a subtle shift in emphasis in the basic attitude of the physicians. It started with the acceptance of the attitude basic in, euthan in the euthanasia movement that there is such a thing as life not worthy to be lived. This attitude in its early stages concerned itself merely with the severely and chronically sick. Gradually, the sphere of those to be included in this category was enlarged to encompass the socially unproductive, the ideologically unwanted, the racially unwanted, and finally, all non-Germans. But it is important to realize that the infinitely small wedged-in lever 
from which this entire trend of mind received its impetus was the attitude toward the non-rehabilitatable sick. That man's name was Leo Alexander. You can find that quote right in the margins on page 208 and 209 of the UCAT. But do you hear what he's saying there? First, they had a bias and they, were, they felt like it was okay to do experimentations and even eliminate people who were uh, physically ill, those who were uh, handicapped, and they felt like they could dispose of them. Uh, the, do the Nazi doctors thought that it would be okay to do this experimentation on them. And just over time, they found that they, they broadened that sphere. A little broader sphere, uh, uh, they added another group of people to it. That they felt like, well, it's okay, we don't really like them, or the, these people are socially unproductive. And you, get, you take this very utilitarian approach towards human life. See, if you don't love life from conception until natural death, if you allow just one little, as he put it, a little wedge, a little lever in there with respect to your, your respect for life, then you're going to allow for more and more and more. It's like the, the old example of the, the frog in hot water. Do you, know, or do you know how to boil a frog? You don't just throw him into the hot water. First you put the frog in a, a pan of, of cold water or cool water, and then you slowly turn up the heat. And he doesn't realize over time uh, that he's uh, getting boiled to death because he's, he's slowly becoming desensitized to the warmth and it's slowly burning his nerve endings in his skin, and then you have boiled frog. And that's where we are in, in many situations in the United States today because we have approved of the use of fetal tissue, you know, uh, fetuses that have been aborted. We'll, we'll experiment on those because we don't, we don't respect the babies. We don't respect the, the, the fetuses, those little, those, we don't even respect the embryos. Those little, little babies with, who are uh, just, you know, even just a few days old, we have seen fit in this country to do experimentation on those embryos. And when you don't have that reverence for life from, the, from its very moment of its conception, uh, over time it's possible to take on a very calloused attitude towards uh, the sanctity of life. I'm going to mention one thing here uh, at, at this point just with respect to, to movies and even video games and some of the violence that takes place in society. Uh, uh, not so much in society, but in entertainment, again, that has to do with desensitizing us towards uh, human life and, and, and love of life. I mean, it's one thing to watch a movie to, to be entertained, but some movies, there's so much gratuitous violence in it and senseless killing. It, it doesn't really have to do with a storyline or they just go out of their way to, to um, uh, you know, kill people. Uh, over time, we become less and less, we, we care about it less and less. When you think too about uh, some of the video games, the, the very graphic video games, the shedding of blood and, the, and the, the, the violent ways that people die in some of these games, it's, um, it's troubling. It is the case that uh, a few years ago in, in the event of the, the shooter who killed I think 22 people on the campus of Virginia Tech, he had actually trained on a video game uh, he practiced, you know, uh, keeping his, his heart rate down and it was apparently a very intense video game and he had on a, a headset and he was listening to music but he was practicing going through what it would be like to experience the shedding of this blood and that's how he was able to, to train himself on this video game, you know, to, to go through and actually carry this out uh, with, with real human beings. He'd, he'd turn them into just images practically on a, in a game. And so again, we want to have that, that love for life and we want to be aware of those, those cases where we become desensitized to life. Question 380 asks, why is it permissible to tolerate the killing of another human being in the case of legitimate self-defense? And we need to protect ourselves. We need to protect our lives and, and to do what we can to protect our lives and the lives of our loved ones and maybe even people we don't know, but because we love life, if there is an aggressor who is trying to violate that or, or, or take that in any way, we are perfectly within our, our boundaries, within our, uh, our rights to protect ourselves and those we love and those around us. Question 381 asks, why is the church opposed to capital punishment? The church is committed to opposing the death penalty because it is both 
cruel and unnecessary, uh, said Pope John Paul II in St. Louis in, a, in an address in 1999. Because we have a, a, a culture where dying and death seems to happen so often, we don't even, it doesn't even phase us anymore. The death penalty and the shock that it should have on us and, and the way it should affect us, it doesn't have the same effect that it did maybe back in the, in the, in the 1700s and the 1800s. And so there's really very few reasons why we would execute a person using the death penalty. The church does still allow for uh, some circumstances where it could be permitted, but because it, 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 it is so, um, the, the Holy Father and, and certainly others within the church don't feel the need to contribute to a further desensitizing of society towards the taking of human life. And so if there is, you, you exhaust the possibilities of trying to rehabilitate that person. And if there is one who is absolutely unrehabilitatable, then in that case, that might be a, that might be a case where you would implement the death penalty. Question 382 asks about the permissibility of offering assistance to the dying. Of course, we never directly bring about the, uh, intentionally bring about the death of another human being. But there are cases where, <clears throat> as the person is dying, we want to uh, help them uh, to be comfortable. We want to give them the, the necessary nutrition and hydration. And those are two things that the, two essentials that the church requires that we still uh, give to a person. Because there are cases where maybe someone is there in there their 80s or 90s and they're, and they're worn out. Their bodies are worn out. Uh, they're, they're tired. They're, they're ready to go home to meet, to meet God. And, but you, you never just say, well, uh, you know, grandma's, grandma's done. You know, we're just going to, to uh, not give her anything to eat or drink. We still always give nutrition and hydration, even through a, a feeding tube. It's still permitted to give uh, that nutrition and hydration through a feeding tube. Some people will say, well, that's an artificial means of, of transporting that nutrition and hydration into the person. And actually, that's not the case. Uh, the, it is it, uh, an, an artificial means of keeping someone would, alive would be to, to use a respirator, uh, but, but to give them nourishment and hydration, with, if it's with a fork or if it's with a, a feeding tube, uh, all, that, all that's required for the feeding tube, it's a uh, minor uh, surgery of, of uh, inserting that tube into their stomach so they can receive that necessary nourishment. So we give them nutrition and hydration. It is not necessary to use extraordinary means or overzealous treatment, long drawn out treatments for someone who might be very old and the prospect of success of, of, a, of a surgery may not uh, be that, that um, the, the surgery may not go that well. And so I, I offer as an example uh, someone who's maybe like an 84 year old cancer patient and they know that they're just filled with cancer and they choose to just take some painkillers and they don't choose for a, the op to have a surgery done because there's a good chance it wouldn't be successful and there's a good chance that they would uh, that they would not be able to survive the after effects of the surgery and heal from the surgery. Now you compare that to a case of someone who's 38 and filled with cancer, but they're, they're in uh, pretty good health and, and there's a good prospect of their making it even after the surgery. Then there, there's two different situations there. Uh, you would go ahead with the, the person who is 38 and try for that that extra treatment, whereas you might not do it with someone who is older, who is elderly. Uh, but again, those are things that you uh, have to take to prayer and you definitely want to uh, discuss with a priest.